Hello everybody and welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at the viscerocranium or the facial bones. And I think the best place probably to start is by looking at the maxilla in some detail. The maxilla interacts with all the other facial bones and we'll see how these bones combine to form the different facial structures. Now the maxilla is actually two separate bones that meet at the midline at the intermaxillary suture. And the maxilla we can think of as having a body and four separate processes. Superiorly, we have frontal processes, laterally, zygomatic processes, and inferiorly, the alveolar process. And then the process we often forget about, the palatine process that extends posteriorly, which makes up the majority of the hard palate. So let's have a look at our CT scan and try and figure out where the body is and then look at those processes to start. So we head over, we'll start with the axial slice and we can see that on either side of the nasal cavity here, we've got two large paranasal sinuses. These are what's known as the maxillary sinuses. Now the body of the maxilla house the maxillary sinuses. So we can see the anterior wall of the body here. The medial wall makes up the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. The posterior wall makes up this anterior surface or anterior boundary of the pterygopalatine fossa. And our posterior lateral wall of the body here faces out towards this space which we call the infratemporal fossa. It's called the infratemporal fossa because it lies below the temporal lobes. If I scroll up superiorly, we see we enter the middle cranial fossa that we looked at in our neurocranium talk, and that's where the temporal lobe lies. So as we scroll down inferiorly, we'll reach this infratemporal fossa. This is not intracranial, it lies underneath the cranium. You can see that on our coronal scan, the medial walls of the body make up the lateral walls of the nasal cavity. And if we scroll posteriorly, we can see that behind the maxilla, here is the infratemporal fossa. You can see it beautifully demonstrated here. Here's where the temporal lobe lies within the middle cranial fossa. Now, as we head out anteriorly again, we can see that the roof of the body of the maxilla bone, or the roof of the maxillary sinuses, makes up the floor of the orbit here. And we can scroll more and more anteriorly, you can see the floor of the orbit. And as we head out anteriorly to the infraorbital margin, the maxilla makes up at least a half of that infraorbital margin, that medial half. Now you may notice as we've been scrolling through here, there's a canal that runs along the floor of the orbit here. This is the pathway for the infraorbital nerve. Now the infraorbital nerve is actually a branch of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. Now you'll remember from the neurocranium talk that the maxillary division passes through the foramen rotundum. So let's maybe have a look at the pathway of the infraorbital nerve. If we scroll posteriorly, we can find the foramen rotundum. We know that the foramen rotundum heads anterior to posterior, like someone looking through binoculars. And we can see it nicely demonstrated here. We can find that on our axial slice as we scroll up. The foramen rotundum is here on either side. This is actually a beautiful slice. I'm going to make sure to include this in the question bank that I've linked below. Now the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve passes through the foramen rotundum and one of its branches is going to head into the inferior orbital fissure. Now when that branch passes through the inferior orbital fissure, it becomes the infraorbital nerve. So let's go to our coronal slice and scroll forward until we see the inferior orbital fissure here. This is where the nerve becomes the infraorbital nerve. As we scroll forward, here's the inferior orbital fissure heading out laterally, we will see a groove forming here. This groove is known as the infraorbital groove. As we head more and more anteriorly, that groove becomes a canal, which is the infraorbital canal, and that canal then heads out to the front of the face, the anterior surface of the face, and exits as the infraorbital foramen. You can see that as well on our 3D model. The groove then extending into the bone, into the floor of the orbit, becoming the infraorbital canal, and then heading out anteriorly as the infraorbital foramen here. You can see that on our axial scan as well. As we head out through the inferior orbital fissure, we will see the groove being formed here, then becoming a canal, and that canal heading out anteriorly as the infraorbital foramen. So we've looked at the body now, let's try and find the processes. If we go on our axial slice, because we're here, and we head up superiorly, we'll be able to find the frontal process of the maxillary bone. So we can see we're at the floor of the orbit here. As we head up more superiorly, this bit of bone here is the frontal process of the maxillary bone. Anterior to that are our nasal bones that we looked at previously. We can see on the sagittal slice here, the nasal bones that extend to the nasion and superiorly the glabella lying above the nasal bones. We can look on our coronal slice and we will remember here that the nasion is where that frontal bone meets the nasal bones at the midline. The nasal bones are separated by the internasal suture, and this point here is what's known as the nasion. 
as we head out posteriorly, here are the frontal processes of the maxilla. Now, as we head more and more posteriorly, the next bone that we're going to encounter is the lacrimal bone. And we're going to look at that later when we look at the nasolacrimal duct. So that's the frontal process. Let's stay on the coronal plane and look for the zygomatic process. We know that the zygoma forms a zygomatic arch. Anteriorly, it's the zygomatic process of the maxilla that joins with the zygoma. And posteriorly, it's the zygomatic process of the temporal bone that we looked at previously. So here we can see the zygomatic process joining with the zygoma. That zygoma is going to form the zygomatic arch here. And as we head more and more posteriorly, we can see the zygomatic process of the temporal bone coming off that squamous section of the temporal bone that we looked at earlier. That's forming the zygomatic arch. I'll show you that on our axial slice. Here's the zygomatic arch. There's not much to the zygoma, so we may as well talk about it here. The zygoma has an anterior surface. It's got a posterior surface that faces the infratemporal fossa that we looked at. And if we scroll up superiorly, the zygoma also has an orbital surface here. It makes up the majority of that anterior lateral part of the orbit. I'm going to show you that on our 3D model. So there's three separate surfaces here, and we've got three processes that extend out to the zygoma. The zygomatic process of the frontal bone, the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone, and the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Let's now look for the alveolar processes, our third process of our maxilla. We head down inferiorly, and we're looking at the bottom of our maxillary sinuses here. We can see, we start seeing the upper teeth here in the upper jaw. These bony processes that house the upper teeth is what's known as the alveolar process. Remember, these are actually two separate bones, and the intermaxillary suture is at the midline here. There should be eight teeth on either side. Let's have a look on our coronal scan. We can see why they are processes, because the maxilla extends down like this. And look how the roots of these teeth come into very close contact with the maxillary sinus. You might notice that the maxillary sinus extends out here. This is what's known as the alveolar recess of the maxillary sinus. We also have zygomatic recesses of the maxillary sinus as we head out towards the zygoma. Our last process that we're going to look at is the palatine process that extends out posteriorly. You can see the palatine process lying across here, lying horizontally on our coronal scan here. It's best looked at on our sagittal scan where you can see the palatine process extending out posteriorly here. We're at the midline and you can see a foramen running behind the incisors. This is the incisive foramen here. Actually, while we're here, you can see a remnant here, which we didn't look at when we looked at our neurocranium talk, and this is our foramen cecum. Sometimes you can have a vessel, a patent foramen running through here, and a vessel extending from the nasal cavity up into the cranium. That's an anatomical variant while we're here. So we can see the incisive foramen. This is where the nasopalatine nerve runs through, and the greater palatine vessels can pass through here. Now the palatine process extends posteriorly, it makes up about two-thirds of the hard palate before becoming the palatine bone, which we're going to look at later. If we have a look at our axial slice, we can scroll down to the palatine process, or in this case scroll up to the palatine process, and we can see we're just catching it in cross-section here. Anteriorly, we have this anterior nasal spine. It lies just below the opening in the nose here. You can actually feel that here. There's a bony projection extending out here. This is the anterior nasal spine. There's a posterior nasal spine when we look at the palatine bone, which is here, the posterior nasal spine. The palatine bone, or the palatine process of the maxilla, is separated along its midline by the median palatine suture. The palatine process is separated from the palatine bone by the transverse palatine suture. Now while we're here, we mentioned this anterior nasal spine, and on our sagittal view, we can see there's an opening here. This opening is what's known as a piriform aperture. Now the lateral walls of the piriform aperture and the inferior border of the piriform aperture is made up by the maxilla bone, and that superior margin is made up by the nasal bones. We can look at it here on our coronal slice. As we head out anteriorly, here are our nasal bones making up the superior border, and then the maxilla making up the lateral and inferior borders of this opening here. It's called the piriform aperture, piriform meaning pear-shaped in Latin. So that opening here anteriorly is called the piriform aperture. If we head out posteriorly and we see the posterior opening into the nasopharynx here, more and more posterior, these posterior openings are what's known as coena. We can see that here on our sagittal, the coena here and piriform aperture here.
Now you may have noticed when we're going through our coronal scan that you've got these spiral shaped passages within the nasal cavity here. Now we're going to look at the nasal cavity in more detail when we look at the paranasal sinuses. But as we were scrolling through here to look at the piriform aperture, you may have noticed that actually within these spiral shaped structures, there's a very thin bone. It's quite difficult to see here. That's actually a separate bone known as the inferior nasal concha. The inferior nasal concha separates the inferior nasal meatus from the middle nasal meatus. Now again, we're going to go through this anatomy in some detail later on, but this, just to let you know, is a separate bone. Concha in Latin means shell-shaped. If someone's blowing a conch to make a horn sound, that shell is wrapped over on itself, and you can see why this is called a concha. There's a middle and superior nasal concha, and that is formed by the ethmoid bone. We're going to look at that later. We can go over to our axial slice and see that inferior nasal concha here separating the inferior nasal meatus from the middle nasal meatus. Now different structures drain into each one of the meati, and here we can see that our maxillary sinus actually drains into the middle nasal meatus here. This is our middle nasal meatus, this is the middle nasal turbinate. The maxillary sinus drains through this complex known as the osteomeatal complex. This opening here is called the maxillary osteum, and then we extend through the infundibulum into a structure known as the hiatus semilunaris. And this hook of tissue here is what's known as the uncinate process. Uncinate meaning hook. We've seen the uncinate process in the pancreas, for example. This complex, again, we're going to look at more when we look at our paranasal sinuses. So we've looked now at the maxillary bone. Now let's have a look at some of the other facial bones that interact with the maxillary bone. We last looked at the palatine process of the maxillary bone extending out posteriorly, and you may have noticed that there's a thin sheet of bone lying above the palatine process. That thin sheet of bone is what's known as the voma. The voma is an unpaired bone that separates the nasal cavity. It bifurcates the nasal cavity. You can see it extends from the body of the sphenoid bone. You might remember this from our previous talk. Here's a hypophyseal fossa. We've got the clivus, we've got the planum sphenoidale or the sphenoidal body or sphenoidal yoke. And then inferiorly, we've got the voma extending down towards the palatine process. The voma attaches to the sphenoid bone at the inferior sphenoid rostrum. If we go back to our coronal slice and we head posteriorly and find that sphenoid sinus here, we can see the rostrum being formed here. And the voma extends to that rostrum and has these two little wings called the alar of the voma that attach to that inferior surface of the body of the sphenoid. The voma bone contributes to the bony nasal septum. When we look at our nasal septum here on the axial slice, you can see some of the nasal septum is bony, and then anteriorly we've got the cartilaginous nasal septum that allows the nose to move externally without actually any bones being broken here. Posteriorly, it's the bony nasal septum. The voma makes up the majority of the posterior part of the bony nasal septum and the inferior part. Superiorly, we've got the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. If we go back to our coronal and then we head out anteriorly, we'll see the ethmoid air sinuses coming into view and you'll see that there's this perpendicular bone that runs down the middle of the ethmoid bone. I'll show you what that looks like on the 3D model as well. That perpendicular plate then joins with the voma forming the bony nasal septum here. We can see the crystogali, that is the superior surface of our ethmoid bone. And it's quite difficult to see here, but this middle septum here is what's known as the perpendicular plate. We can see the ethmoid bone makes up the roof of our nasal cavities, as well as making up the lateral borders of the ethmoid air sinuses and the nasal cavities. This lateral border here is what's known as the lamina papyracea, a very thin bone that makes up the medial walls of the orbit. We, again, we're also going to look at the ethmoid and how it drains into the nasal cavities in more detail when we look at paranasal sinuses. The last part of that bony nasal septum is this process extending up from the palatine process or from the maxilla, and that's what's known as the maxillary crest. All of those three structures make up the bony nasal septum. Now, when we were looking at the osteomeatal complex, we saw that the maxillary sinuses drain into the middle nasal meatus. And you may have noticed that while we were scrolling through, there was another pathway that extended down here. This is a different pathway. We can see it coming from the orbit here. And as we scroll anteriorly, it's extending down into the inferior nasal meatus.
It's often better seen on our sagittal slice as we head out laterally. We can see that from the orbit down into the inferior nasal meatus is this pathway here. That's what's known as a nasolacrimal canal. Now I mentioned the lacrimal bone when we were looking at the frontal process of the maxillary bone. I said the frontal process of the maxillary bone extended up and was separated by the nasal bones. And there's a crest that's formed that's known as the anterior lacrimal crest. That crest is on the frontal process of the maxillary bone. Behind that crest is what's known as the lacrimal fossa that houses the lacrimal sac superiorly. That lacrimal fossa then marks the point of where the lacrimal bone is formed. The lacrimal bone is a very small bone. It makes up some of the medial portion of the orbit. If we scroll a little bit more, we can see that there's a small little crest here known as the posterior lacrimal crest. That marks the margin for when the lacrimal bone is separated into its orbital surface and its lacrimal surface. If we follow the lacrimal sac now inferiorly and head down further and further, we've got a lacrimal hook here that extends and joins the maxilla. We've now created a canal that houses the nasolacrimal duct. That canal, the nasolacrimal canal, extends down into the inferior nasal meatus. There's actually a valve here known as the valve of Hasner that prevents fluid from flowing up the nasolacrimal canal. So the lacrimal bone is just a small bone. It interacts with the frontal process of the maxillary bone at the lacrimal maxillary suture. Posterior to the lacrimal bone is the ethmoid bone, that lamina papyracea that extends and makes up the rest of the medial border of the orbit. And that's about it for the superior and anterior facial bones. Now let's head inferiorly and look at the palatine bone and the sphenoid bone and how they create some unique facial structures. Let's go to our sagittal slice, go back to the midline, and let's find the palatine process. We said that the palatine process of the maxilla then joins to the palatine bone. And there we've got a transverse palatine suture separating that palatine process from the palatine bone. Now the palatine bone has a horizontal part and a vertical part. The horizontal part extending out posteriorly and horizontally. And the vertical part of the palatine bone extends from the lateral borders of the palatine bone and extends superiorly towards the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. So we've got the sphenoid bone superiorly sending down the pterygoid processes. We've got the palatine bone inferiorly sending up its vertical part of the palatine bone. So let's head out laterally and hopefully they will see that there are these structures heading up. We've got pterygoid processes and we've got the palatine bone extending superiorly. Now it's difficult on this view to see exactly what's palatine bone and what's sphenoid bone. So we're going to go over to our axial slice here. What I find easiest is to find the sphenoid sinus, find the sphenoid bone and get your orientation. We've got the clivus posteriorly here, the sphenoid here, the body of the sphenoid. And as we head out inferiorly, we will see these processes coming down. These processes are the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. The lateral process forms as an attachment point for some of the muscles of mastication. And we're going to look at the muscles of mastication in great detail, a whole video looking at where they attach and what movements they have on the face. So that's the lateral pterygoid plate. The medial pterygoid plate, as we head out inferiorly, you see actually hooks round underneath the lateral pterygoid plate. You see how it's hooking round like that. We'll see it better on our coronal slice as we head out posteriorly. We'll come into contact with those pterygoid plates. We've got a lateral pterygoid plate and a medial pterygoid plate. You can see it on both sides. Look how that medial pterygoid plate actually hooks round and that can vary from patient to patient. So we've seen where the pterygoid processes are. How does that relate to the palatine bone? Again, let's head up superiorly. And we've looked, we've mentioned multiple times, this pterygopalatine fossa. Now our next video is going to look at the pterygopalatine fossa in some detail. And getting an appreciation for these structures now is gonna serve well as we go into that video. But as we head up superiorly in the pterygopalatine fossa, we're going to see an opening here that's known as the sphenopalatine foramen, which connects the pterygopalatine fossa to the nasal cavity. Slightly superior to that sphenopalatine foramen, we're going to see a canal that's extending from the carotid canal, or more specifically, from the foramen lacerum here, heading out and connecting the pterygopalatine fossa to the carotid canal, or to the foramen lacerum. This is what's known as the vidian canal or the pterygoid canal. And the vidian artery as well as some nerves pass through this canal. We can head out more superiorly, we should be able to see the foramen rotundum that's superior and lateral to the vidian canal.
If you find the foramen rotundum and head down inferiorly, that marks where the pterygopalatine fossa starts. Let's find the Vidian Canal again, and we know that medial to the Vidian Canal, we also have a passageway. We've seen the sphenopalatine foramen, we've seen the Vidian Canal. Medial to that is the palatovaginal canal. Now, the palatovaginal canal can sometimes be bifid like this, have two separate canals, or it can be a single canal heading down into the nasopharynx here. And that's why this is called the pharyngeal canal, because it connects the pterygopalatine fossa to the pharynx here. And it's the pharyngeal nerve that runs through the pharyngeal canal. Now, the reason I'm showing you these structures is to show you how to find the superior aspect of the pterygopalatine fossa. You can see on our sagittal section here, we've cut the pterygopalatine fossa. And as we head down inferiorly, we can see that two separate foramens form, known as the greater and lesser palatine foramina. The greater palatine foramen is normally more anterior and often more lateral, and the lesser is posterior. Those are the two exit points of the pterygopalatine fossa. We can see them here, and as we head out actually to our sagittal slice, see how you can see the lesser palatine foramen here laterally, and then the greater palatine foramen heading out into the palatine bone here. So the palatine bone makes up this medial wall of the pterygopalatine fossa. Let's head up. This medial wall here is, uh, is the palatine bone. It's the vertical portion of the palatine bone. That vertical portion terminates at that sphenopalatine foramen here. So you can see how closely the vertical portion of the palatine bone interacts with the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone heading down inferiorly. This vertical portion in some cases can actually extend up and make up a very small portion of the orbit here at the posterior medial surface of the orbit, but that's difficult to see on the scan. So let's move on to our last bone, and this bone is a little bit controversial because some people don't include it in the viscerocranium. It's not technically attached to the skull itself, and that's the mandible. Now I've used this very detailed scan here, and this doesn't actually include the mandible, so I'm going to head over to another scan, and we're going to look at the mandible here. While we're here, we may as well look at it. So let me change over to that scan now. I've actually got a CT scan of the cervical spine. We're gonna get the mandible in nicely here. Let's get our orientation, go to our sagittal slice. We can see the palatine process here. We can see the incisive foramen. Here is the alveolar process of the maxillary bone. Our nasal bones, we're at the midline here. You may notice then that below the maxilla, below the apple teeth, we have this other bone known as the mandible. That's what we're going to look at today. I'm extending out laterally. Here is the mandible wrapping all the way around. We know the mandible, it's the lower jaw. Let's head onto our axial slice and go down to the mandible. The mandible houses the lower teeth and we can separate the mandible also into multiple different parts. The body of the mandible is this anterior part here. The body can be separated into a bony part and an alveolar part. The alveolar part is what houses the teeth. The bony part is below the teeth here. This bony part is also known as the base of the body of the mandible. Now, as we head out posteriorly, we're going to reach an angle here that's better seen on our sagittal slice. We go to this angle. This angle posteriorly is what's known as the angle of the mandible. The angle of the mandible marks where the body then becomes the mandibular ramus. The ramus is this vertical portion of the mandible here. On our coronal scans, you can see the ramus heading from inferior to superior, making up these two bony rami. The ramus then extends up superiorly into two different processes. A condylar process that has a neck and a head and articulates with our temporal bone. Remember, we have that shallow condylar fossa of the temporal bone lying on the inferior surface of the temporal bone. And then we have this notch forming known as the mandibular notch that extends out anteriorly to a process that's known as the coronoid process. And it's the coronoid process that's an attachment site for the temporalis muscle. Again, we're gonna look at this in some detail when we look at muscles of mastication. Now you may notice that while we scroll through the mandible, there are a couple of foramina here. We can see anteriorly, there's a small foramina on either side of the body of the mandible. This is what's known as the mental foramen, and you'll be able to see that when you look at the 3D model. Now we've seen three separate foramina coming out anteriorly to the skull. We've seen the supraorbital foramen, the infraorbital foramen, and the mental foramen. And those nerves are from the three separate divisions of the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic division, maxillary division, and mandibular division.
If we head out posteriorly on this mandible, you can see on the interior surface or the medial surface of the mandible here, on the ramus of the mandible, we have these two canals being formed here. That's the mandibular canal, where the inferior alveolar nerve travels in that mandibular canal. It's also a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So that interior opening, that's the mandibular foramen, and that extends into the mandibular canal here. So that's about all I want to cover for the mandible. Now the mandible obviously has many different movements. It's got many different muscle attachment sites. We can see that it also, the ramus of the mandible here, separates the superficial and deep limbs of the parotid gland. It's a complicated region. We're gonna look at this closely in multiple different talks. Muscles of mastication, muscles of facial expression. We're going to look at the deep neck spaces and these structures become incredibly important. I hope that this video has given you a good understanding of how the viscerocranium, how the facial bones connect with one another to form these complex face structures here. Now the best way again, and I'm always going to say this, to learn these structures is to go through scans yourself and try and identify each one of these structures. I've linked below a bank of questions. Every time I do a video, I'm gonna be adding to that bank of questions. We've had multiple pe people already go through it and really enjoy the questions. I'm trying to make the level of those questions that of the FRCR part one exams or your radiology part one anatomy exams. People often fall short in those exams because they're stressing about the physics and don't realize how complicated some of this anatomy can get. So I've included quite complex questions in that question bank that you go and check out in the description below. I can't wait to get to our next video because I feel like I've mentioned the pterygopalatine fossa many times in both of these talks. We're going to look at it in detail. It's a great structure to know because once you know that fossa, you can kind of work your way out in the scan and figure out the surrounding anatomy. So until that video, I'll see you all there. Goodbye, everybody.